speciation, the origin of new species. So where do species come from? Well, we've already gone over that. Um, they come from a common ancestor. Okay, so for example, all these species here are found only in Hawaii and they're all related. They are um, called honey creepers, but not all of them are uh, nectar drinkers, but they're all related to one ancestor that somehow uh, made it to the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, it looks like from Asia, I think, um, <clears throat> and got blown there. No, we don't know how. Um, landed on the islands, and then, through a long, very long process, speciated into all these different species that have different ways of making a living. Similarly, uh, in the Caribbean, there are all these islands. Uh, anoles, um, and anolis lizards, are quite common on all the different islands. And we often see examples of uh, convergent evolution. So. Anolis on islands are related to each other, but anolis on islands that um, that occupy the same sort of habitat, like the twig anole on one island, is very much like a twig anole on another. They look almost identical, but they're actually not that closely related compared to the, all the other lizards on that same island. So then there's another, um, uh, like the trunk anole, or this uh, leaf anole, or whatever. So these are examples of adaptation and speciation. And then, how do species originate? So there's mechanisms of speciation. We're going to go over those and how that happens. But sometimes you get patterns that are kind of interesting. For example, you have these uh, different species of butterflies. Um, now, butterflies um, drink nectar, and a lot of butterflies are specialists on certain plants. They also lay their eggs on plants, and the caterpillars eat them. So whenever you have a lot of different host plants in uh, diversity, uh, usually similar species, you get a corresponding species richness, number of different species in a different butterfly species. So, um, uh, Charaxis is much more speciose than Polyura, and that's because there's 189 species uh, that, that uh, feed on host plants, 247 species, and so on. So, the same thing happens with uh, Morpho and uh, Coriolis. Okay. Speciation. The process of forming new species. So this was one of the big things, of course, that Darwin figured out and, and Wallace too. Um, people didn't know where species came from uh, for a long time. They were thought that they were uh, divinely created and all that. Um, and then also we have to answer kind of what is a species. So we're going to watch a little video. Okay, so what are species? Well, um, as you saw, um, it obviously has to do with breeding for the most part. But let's say we can say a group of population or populations of similar individuals, but that doesn't really tell us much. So normally when we talk about something, it's actually the biological species concept, it's that individuals in a population or populations that are capable of breeding and producing ses successful offspring uh, are a separate species and this breeding produces something called gene flow. Okay? And so if populations that are reproductively isolated by a lack of gene flow from other populations, that means you've got a population 
even if individuals get together, if they can't breed, they're separate species. Now, so the big deal here, the bottom line, is uh, what's called reproductive isolation. Uh, but let's go on a little bit. Okay, so in a definition, a species is the most evolutionarily independent unit. Okay, actually it's probably populations, but for our, our uh, talk, that means evolutionary independence implies all the different forces uh, in evolution are separate, like mutation, selection, uh, gene flow and drift operate on populations separately. Species consist of interbreeding populations that evolve independently of other populations. The essence of speciation is a lack of gene flow. Okay, this is reproductive isolation. Species form a boundary between each other because of this boundary of there's no uh, gene flow going on. Now, the species problem is something that we're not going to really deal with, but there's a lot of problems with the species problem, mainly because if you think about it, speciation happens all over time, slowly usually, but still over time. It doesn't happen like a snap of a finger. Oh, suddenly two populations are the same species, and then suddenly they're two separate species. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Um, the thing is, when we define species like this, we're actually looking at it from a snapshot in time. And so it's kind of misleading. So, what's a species? Well, these are uh, a lion and a leopard. They're both in the felid or the cat family. Uh, and they're both in the same genus, Panthera. Uh, they're separate species. Why? Well, they look different, don't they? Uh, the thing is, why are they actually a separate species? Like, for example, if you had a lion and a tiger, pine, lions and tigers can actually interbreed. Unfortunately, they have hybrid infertility where the offspring are not fertile. Okay, but what about our dog family? Okay, so dogs are descended from an ancestor of the gray wolf that we find in North America and Europe um, and uh, Siberia and all that. So they descended from this ancestor of the gray wolf. Now, the thing is, there's a lot of variation that we know of from dogs in terms of dog breeding. We've got very small dogs. We've got very large dogs. The question is, um, are they the same species? Well, can these two interbreed? Well, um, yes, they can, but it would probably be rather uncomfortable. Uh, and if... The female was uh, the little one. It would probably die um, uh, during childbirth or something like that. But anyway, and if it was a male, the little one was a male, how would it man man manage to actually mount the, uh, the Great Dane? Okay, so we have different species concepts. The main one is a species is a group of individuals. This is a biological species concept. Uh, in a population that it interbreed and produce fertile offspring, but that cannot interbreed with other species or in individuals in other populations. Okay? That means the main thing is they're reproductively isolated. Okay. Now, there are problems with it, namely, um, we don't know about fossils. Did, did, when we get fossils, can we tell if this... Uh, organism in this fossil was able to interbreed with this fossil. We can't tell that. Uh, asexuals, like we talked about with bacteria, um, are they geographically separated groups? So if you bring, let's say, um, plants do this a lot, but let's say orchids from Africa 
and orchids from South America, you can actually get them to hybridize and produce a new variety. Now, according to the biological species concept, they're the same species, but they're not really. Um, in fact, they've evolved separately over a long period of time. It's just that in plants are a lot more forgiving about um, uh, genetic incompatibility. Okay. So there's another species concept, uh, the morpho species concept. Species are groups of individuals that are morphologically similar and clearly distinguishable from individuals and other groups, including fossils. Now, with fossils, this is about the only concept we have. We don't know whether they were uh, reproductively isolated, nor can we actually get genes from them or DNA. Uh, problems include polymorphisms, geographic variation, cryptic species. We'll see. look at those in a second. And then there's something called the phylogenetic species concept, which looks past in history in terms of uh, common ancestry and all that. Okay. So... For example, um, these are different species of garter snake. Uh, are they reproductively isolated each other? Oh, these are termites, all of the same species, and yet and yet they. Um, they look a lot different. We have a worker, we have a soldier, we have a queen, a reproductive, and we have a nymph. Okay? And yet, they're all considered the same species. In fact, <coughs> in some species, it really wasn't recognized for a long time that these different casts were different species, they were the same species. Okay. And then, these are salamanders, and do we consider all these over here all the same species and can they actually interbreed together? Okay, so the biological uh, species concept um, considers population to be independently ev uh, evolutionary independent if they're reproductively isolated. That's the whole deal. Mechanisms that and reproductive isolation mechanisms that greatly reduce gene flow between populations even when they are not geographically separate. Okay. Morpho species concept. Okay, so look at these frogs here. Um, they have a distinct morphology. The one on the top looks different than the other. Are they genetically similar? Are they considered color variations of the same species? Breeding these frogs would determine their classification under the biological species concept. It turns out that this is just geographic variation, but they are in fact the same species. They may look different, but when you put them together, they still breed together, they still produce viable offspring. So you can see where morphological species the morphology, the anatomy, how they look is different, but they actually are the same. Um, morpho species. So these are different butterfly species. They're part of a species complex. They're, some of them are probably capable of interbreeding with each other, but they're called cryptic species. So by looking at them, we would really have to do some genetic studies and some reproductive studies to see. And a lot of these are just normal variation in the population. So there's a lot of species that have a great deal of, of variation. And then, of course, there's morphology is all we have for fossils. So these are trilobites over a period of time on an axis. And they look very similar. Are they the same species? We would call them chronospecies. species. Uh, there might be millions of years between each group. So, morpho species concept is sometimes all we have, but it can be very misleading. Okay, so 
Um, let's see here. And then finally, there's the phylogenetic species concept. And again, this is a, an evolutionary tree. We've talked about that. Uh, common ancestor, right, of the cat family. That was ancestor of both. And then eventually, um, the cat family has split into many different species. Uh, in fact, uh, leopards and lions are more closely related than domestic cats. Okay. Okay. But now if we put these together... Now, we do have a common ancestor, even further back in time, and that's to all carnivores. Okay, here's the common ancestor for both. In one direction went wolves and dogs. So there's two main carniv carnivorous groups, um, terrestrial carnivores, uh, kind of the dog family, um, and bear family, and then the cat family. And then there's this other family over here, the cats. Okay, so a phylogenetic species concept says that species are separate if they share a genetic, a unique genetic history. Okay, species are, as a reason, are irreducible group whose members are descended from a common ancestor. Okay, all members possess a combination of certain defining traits. Um, in this case, all of these are mammals, uh, but that's an ancestral trait. They're also all carnivores, but what are the differences between the dog family and the cat family? Okay, hence this concept defines a species as a group having a shared and unique evolutionary history. Okay, so, and sometimes you can be misled by what things look like. Okay, we have the ancestor of elephants. And <clears throat> there's the Indian elephant, which is off by itself. This is showing no extinct elephants like mastodons and mammoths. And then African elephants. Okay, it used to be thought that all African elephants, there was only one species, and that was basically the African savanna elephant. But people started to realize that um, Cameroon um, and uh, African forest elephants, actually mainly in the West, in the Congo and things like that, look different. They're smaller. They have other features that are different. And finally, someone decided to do a uh, look at DNA. And they found out, in fact, that um, the DNA was, was different between this group and this group. And so we now know that, in fact, African elephants and savanna elephants, African savanna and forest elephants are different species. Um, and I'm not sure if they can interbreed or not, but they're considered separate species now, according to the phylogenetics concept. Okay, so we already know, we're familiar with this. Um, Pre-existing species, they come from a common ancestor, like all these vertebrates. Where do you come from? Well, you come from parents. Why might descendants of either families or species resemble each other? Because they share a genetic uh, genetics and genes that they inherited from their common ancestors and they share an evolutionary history. So speciation is considered the process by which one species splits to form two or more species and it's a three-step process. First you have genes that is disrupted between two populations or between one population that splits it in two. It's usually a geographic barrier, but it can be other things too. Okay? If you remember back to the video, remember when this happens, gene pools become reproductively isolated. 
okay? That means there's no gene flow between these two separate populations. Over time, these populations, even though they might have come from a, the single population, they shared an, an evolutionary ancestor, but has enough differences happened in terms of genetic differences in alleles because of uh, all the different forces of evolution, including natural selection, sexual selection, migration, gene flow, um, genetic drift, mutation, all these things happen. Mutations happen very rarely, but they happen and they accumulate in the separate populations over time. If they get to a certain point for it's gone on long enough or enough changes have happened, something called um, reproductive isolation happens. Okay? And when this happens, whether it's because before they um, they they won't mate anymore because they've mated at different times, uh, they have different um, genitals, uh, they meet in different places, they mate in different places, so they don't reproduce, um, they behaviorally don't recognize each other as the same species, all these kinds of things, or what are called postzygotic isolation, like hybrid inviability and hybrid infertility or sterility. Okay, so this is basically what we just said. We've got lineages within the original species. Um, and let's say they're separate subpopulations. And they all exchange genes within each other. In other words, there it's an interbreeding population. Okay. They're all one big happy family. Okay. Now, <clears throat> something some reproductive barrier suddenly gets in the way. Sometimes, normally we think of it as a reproductive barrier, I mean as a geographical barrier, and we're going to think about that first, but it can be other things too. Um, and when that happens, so we've got a single reproductively cohesive population down here, right? Barrier to gene flow right here. And it splits these populations into two or more populations that are isolated. So we'll say this group and we'll say this group. The populations gradually diverge. Why? Well, they're now separate. There's no gene flow going on. There's gene flow going on within subpopulations of the two origin of these two groups, these two popular big populations, but none between them. Okay? So over time they accumulate mutations. They uh um are they interact with the environment differently and there's different selection pressures on them. Um they uh don't um, they have different mating rituals, all these kinds of different things. So these graduation, they uh, begin to diverge, right? Reproductive isolating mechanisms evolve to the point where isolation, there's now isolated in terms of reproductive isolation. And then if enough things have happened in terms of reproductive isolation, like members are incapable of interbreeding anymore, the populations are now considered separate species. Take a look at this like we saw before. Let's say this barrier here uh, is uh, a river that goes through between two populations and they can no longer cross back and forth. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned first that we're going to look at it from a geographic perspective, and this is the most common um, form of 
of speciation that we have. And it's actually geographic, including uh, over time. Okay, so species don't suddenly and geographically separate, I mean they're completely separated right away. They take time. Okay, when two populations are separated geographically, so now they're one's on one side of the river, one's on the other. This is called vicariance. Vicariance, a separation or division of a group of organisms by a geographic barrier. Okay? And this causes, or um, another one is dispersal, but we'll look at that in a second. This is the most common mode, which is allopatric speciation. Speciation of populations in different places over time. Okay? So, We'll take a look at this in greater detail, but here's a, um, a graph or a, a figure. We've got one big population, right? Hold on a second. Okay. So we've got allopatric speciation by vicariants. We have one big population. They can interbreed and all that. There's some reproductive barrier. Um, let's say it's um, um, uh, uh, sea level, sea level rise, and now what we've got is we've got two separate populations. So there's water between. We've got now two populations. Over time, they start to differentiate because they're on different evolutionary trajectories. One side of the barrier of water might be different in terms of the climate than the other. Um, these two populations accumulate different mutations. All these different forces. Genetic drift is going on. Over time, they become very, very different. There's the red population and the green population. Let's say the water barrier, uh, we get to an ice age, the water level drops, and these, this area comes together into one big happy group again. The question is, are they separate species or are they uh, the same species? If they can actually interbreed and produce viable offspring that have the same fitness as either parental species, then they're all the same species. If, on the other hand, there are reproductive isolating mechanisms, whether before pre-mating or after mating, then they are separate species. And then there might be what's called a hybrid zone, where there's some limited gene flow there, but let's say one side of the island um, is drier, much drier than the other. So there's some gene flow right in the middle, but both sides are quite different from each other. One is very dry, uh, we'll say this side, and the other one is very wet. Okay, now, okay, now there are also another way that you can actually get two separate places, and that's um, dispersal and colonization, and this was given a, it's still allopatric speciation, uh, speciation but it was, um, given another term called peripatric speciation. So again, you have one big population. A little part of this population decides to go and where do they go? They fly, it's a bird, bunch of birds. They fly off to a different population or let's say some plants that somehow float off to a different population. This is a separate island right? Okay. So, 
there's now a founder effect. Remember what the founder effect is. That's where you have a small group that moves from one large population to another location and starts a new population or a new population. Does that new population become a species? Okay. Now this could also be a, a situation um, where it's a, um, a continental island. So we have a bunch of islands off the coast here, the Channel Islands, right? They're not very far. At one time during the Ice Age, uh, they were all part of the mainland. Okay? So one might say that um, here there was this peak that was all... Um, actually, let's do this. Okay, and it was all part of the one big population. Um, ice age ends, water comes in between them, they're isolated. This population eventually uh, develops um, differently. Uh, there's no gene flow going on. Um, again, when they come back together, there's, let's say, a range expansion, or let's say um, the water level drops again. Uh, are they one species or separate species? The same thing would happen with the other one. Oh, when populations come back together and they're now in the same location, the range uh, uh, overlaps is called sympatry. So... Sympatry is within the same location. Allopatry, different location. Okay. And then there's something called sympatric speciation. We'll look at that um, separately uh, later on. And we're not going to talk about parapatric speciation. Okay. So geographic barriers. This is vicariance, right? And this is what we saw before with a kaibab squirrel. And um, the Albert squirrel. Now, at one time, of course, uh, first of all, there was uplift, but there used to be just one uh, single layer, right, all across there, okay, and there was no river, and it was all much lower, and they were all one species. Okay, you call it Franken squirrel. And then, of course, uh, in addition to the river coming in and cutting through this rock, this rock was being uplifted from about, oh, 3,000 feet up to about 8,000 feet. Um, and the north rim over here is um, about 8,000 8, feet. The uh, south rim is about 6,500 feet. So it's kind of sloped over. So... Again, this is allopatric speciation in the Grand Canyon, a geographic barrier in this case, uplift and then uh, a river cutting across it and there's now a big chasm and this blocks gene flow. It's called vicariance. And there's other examples, mountains, valleys, canyons, rivers, oceans, continental plate, tectonics, you know, also obviously when you have populations in one large location and then over hundreds of millions of years separate, that's also vicariance. So we're going to look at this uh, in more detail. So we've got these lizards and we've got these lizard, uh, these are this river and we can also see it's a continent. We can see some differences. It's lighter on the right hand side compared to more reddish pink on the left, okay? And we've got all these different color morphs, uh, very dark, um, almost black, um, dark green, uh, medium green, medium light green, very light green, okay? And it turns out all these different color morphs, uh, there's equal uh, frequency. In other words, 
there's five different morphs, so 20% for each frequency uh, within the whole population. They can all interbreed. Okay. Now, what happens? Oops. A barrier. The river changes course and, of course, separates these populations and they don't swim and they're now isolated. Okay. So we still start out with the same sort of frequency. We're going to say that it's this uh, river changes course um, and overnight there's two separate populations, but it could take some time. Okay, you could also end up with something else that separates a population. Let's say a new disease or species that eats them uh, and in the middle it's lower down, that's where this uh, parasite lives, and up and high they, the two populations can get along. I mean, they can survive, but not lower down. But anyway... Okay, so over time, the populations, now we've got the left bank population after 20 generations, the right bank population. <coughs> after 20 generations, things have changed. Now, there's also different soil types. We'll say on the right-hand side, it's drier. On the left-hand side, it's wetter, okay? And certain morphs do better uh, in each location. So darker morphs are, are uh, more common on the left bank, and lighter morphs are more common on the right. And in the right bank, there's a new mutation. It's a spotty mutation. So they've actually got now a spotty mutation. Okay, that's uh, shown up. That's a little bit too big. Uh, let's, uh, now, what happens? More time has passed. We're now at 40 generation. He's now got a spotty mutation. We becoming more common at the end of selection, right? This generation, on the left-hand side, they're becoming darker and darker and darker. There's very few light-colored ones left. On the right-hand side, um, there's kind of not as many dark, but um, there's more diversity and there's a lot of mutation that's accumulating in the population. 60 generations later. The one on the left, all the light morphs are gone, right? And it's only darker morphs. The ones on the right, lighter morphs plus the spotty mutation. And uh, up here and becoming much more prevalent. Okay. So, are these species different? Are these populations separate species? Well, we'd have to find out. We'd have to do breeding. Can they interbreed successfully? Um, whether it's, uh, do they recognize each other as pos possible mates? Do they dance the same way? Um, do they breed at the same time? Do they breed in the same habitat? Uh, it looks like Remember, there's soil differences and other things, and so they might be completely different species at this point. Now, okay. And we've seen this kind of thing before. Um, the Isthmus of Panama. At one time, remember, this was all... It was, no, it was all water here. All these different uh, snapping shrimp they were all a couple of different species okay um and there were i don't know how many different species we can see here we got one two three four five six different species of snapping shrimp okay 
Um, and then about five million years ago, what happened? Okay. The uh, Panama uh, volcanic activity connected uh, all these volcanic islands all came together and formed land bridge all the way across from North America to South America. What had been all these six different species, and this was all one sea, you know, the Pacific Caribbean kind of connected. So there were six different species. Now they've been separated. Okay? So we've got, let's say, Pacific and Caribbean one. We'll say this one and this one. Two, this one, and this one. Three, this one, and this one. That's a bad one. Okay, if you look at this phylogeny, even if all these species on the Caribbean side right here, they're separate species, and you might think they're more related to each other because they're on one side of the canal, while the other side is over here, right? And there's two main groups. Well, it doesn't work that way. It actually turns out that the species that are red, now how the uh, Panama Isthmus came up, they were one species. The black species, they were one species. And if you actually look at the gene, they would show there are more genes together than the other side. And they might even be Canal zone is um, right around here. And then when I was there, uh, I went into an area called Darien. Um, this is Darien, Eastern Province. Uh, the Columbia border is right next door. It's an and then I went to another place, big old volcanic caldera, um, um, low, called Valley de Rancho, and it was wonderful. Anyway, you should go there. Okay. Now, what about parapathic speciation? Remember, this is like the basically allopathic speciation, same kind of thing. We've got an island, we've got a barrier, water they can't cross. There's some kind of bridge. They're able to disperse across. Uh, what kind of effect is this? Does I remember where you go, a small population journeys to a new place and starts a new population. Founder effect. The, or the um, morphs that get to w the island are probably, let's say, different. In fact, they're lighter than the ones that are on the mainland. Um, and over time, let's say there's a mutation. And over generations, we're going to see, if you remember the abrasions, the bar um, Let's see. Um, we have bar graph. Uh, 
Okay, and then this one. And of course, what happens when the sea level rises uh, or drops? Um, this is an island off the coast. Now it's connected to the mainland. Can they integrate or not? So, what factors must be present for our last tech deviation to occur? It's removed. If it's removed, and the two reunited populations breed, what attributes must offspring have in order for the two populations? Um, according to the biological species concept, uh, if the two populations in section two are determined to still be the same species, did allopatric species occur? No. Okay. This is an example of all these species. These are oceanic islands way out in the middle of the Pacific. Somehow they were volcanic, so once the volcanic islands were created from volcanic eruptions. Nothing lived on them, but eventually they got colonized by all kinds of different things, including fruit flies and silver sword plants and crickets and uh, honey creeper birds, all these different things. These islands rose up at different times. So younger over here, older over here. We can see this. So more recent lineage, more ancient lineage, so this is Hawaii, the most recent. Um, Maui and Molokai uh, used to form one big island when the sea level was lower. Oahu, Kauai, Nihau. And then if you go all the way out up here, you get to Midway, um, which was also part of the Hawaiian Islands. Okay, so there's, a, we, there's a already now, um, there was one colonization, probably happened on Kauai about five million years ago, right here. And then over time, as the new islands rose up, some individuals dispersed to the new island, started another population. So now there's two populations and they dispersed. Topography. There's some valleys, there are tropical valleys, high mountains, uh, volcanoes, all that kind of stuff. Dry parts of certain islands, wet parts, all that. And over time, there's over 500 species now of Drosophila. Uh, they've dispersed, they've speciated in all these different kinds of species. Okay. And then finally, there's sympatric speciation where you actually have speciation in the same place. How does that happen? Here you have a population. They're interbreeding. And somehow certain members start hanging out, let's say, in different places, different kinds of habitat in the same location. They start to diverge on the time, uh, over time. They develop reproductive isolating mechanisms. Eventually, they're different, um, isolated from one another. So, sympatry is the same homeland, speciation in the same place. Gene flow is still possible, but somehow developmental and reproductive isolation without geographic barriers, disruptive selection followed by ecological speciation. So, let's take a look at this. This is an example. In North America, there's a native hawthorn trees. There's a number of different species. Um, and you can actually see what uh, the fruit they make. They make a berry. And they're parasitized by a fly that lays their eggs in the berries. Okay? And so hawthorn flies always 
lay their eggs on hawthorn leaves, and they also might do, they might also pollinate hawthorn flowers, but they're attracted, it turns out, uh, to the scent of hawthorn trees. Well, about 300 years ago, Europeans started showing up, and they brought all kinds of things with them, including they brought apple trees. Okay. They started planting apples. There were lots of hawthorn trees native to the area. They were planting apple trees amongst the hawthorn trees. And over time, for some reason, these are both in the same location, right? Interspersed within, within each other, the plants. The hawthorn flies, some of them started, perhaps because of competition, started laying their eggs on uh, apples and in apples and apple trees. And over time, things started to diverge. They still look very similar, okay? But they respond differently to their environment. If you put them uh, in a cage, a glass cage, and you give them either an apple scent or a hawthorn scent, the apple flies go to the apple scent, the hawthorn flies go to the hawthorn scent. Those flies have also changed in terms of uh, genetics. Okay, another example are um, these fish in these uh, Rift Lake, Valley Lakes in uh, Africa. And these are new lakes. Um, they were dry basins and then they were flooded. And each of these lakes was um, was colonized in this flood by a different species or a species of chiclet fish. And over time, these different ecological circumstances developed. And um, so you had some species that were feeding up uh, in the middle of the lake, up on top. Others uh, uh, in kind of uh, uh, in greater depths eating fish, others along the, the, the uh, bottom eating snails, um, a generalized body, 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 um, bottom feeder. And over this time in these lake, like Lake, lake Victoria, there are now over 500 species of chiclet fish and they look and act completely differently. And they're actually in many cases, separate species, there is some interbreeding going on, but they look like different lineages. Okay. So.